Today is discerning prayer, and we're going to see how the Apostle Peter is, has quite the dilemma on his hands, a good dilemma. I mean, what would you think today after this church service was over and you went outside the doors and I preached a sermon and 3,000 people joined the church? How, what, would, what would that look like, right? Well, that's what Peter is dealing with here in Acts chapter 11, because um, if you go back to Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches one of the most famous sermons of all time on the streets of Jerusalem, um, and over 3,000 people Join, receive Christ, get baptized that day, uh, in one day. Um, he says things to them like, um, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ so your sins can be forgiven, so the times of refreshing may come. So for the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he exhorted them to save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who received the message were baptized, about 3,000 people in a day. And so a lot of those people that are on the streets of Jerusalem at that time, they weren't Jews. They were non-Jews. They're called Gentiles. More than likely, that's all of us in the room. (laughs) Um, Gentiles. And uh, they all joined the church at one time. So then Peter has, Peter as the, essentially the, the pastor of this first church, has to deal with how do I, what do I do with all these people? Um, how do I integrate them into what, this, what the Holy Spirit is doing in our midst? They need to land somewhere. And so in Acts chapter 11, you see these words. And Peter is lament, he's really grieving in prayer. Not grieving, but he is um, agonizing in prayer over this. Because the Jewish law would say that these people were unclean. They're uncircumcised. Uh, was God's promise only for the Jews? Because Jesus said things like, hey, I've come for the Jews first. And salvation comes through the Jews, but then, um, but then of course it goes to everybody else. So that maybe a lot of Jews at that t- Jewish believers at that time thought that this word, this the message of the gospel, was only for the Jewish people. And so Peter is agonizing over this in prayer. He's trying to discern what do I need to do? What is right? What is wrong? How do I know? And then the Lord gives him a vision that settles the matter for for Peter in Acts chapter eleven. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Some things never change. Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, And it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? And when they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Then God has even given to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. If you've never been in a situation um, where you have two parties that want your ear, they want to convince you one way or the other, and you feel that temptation to give in to one or the other, this is where Peter finds himself right now in this, uh, this account. We don't know how long this went on, that the, these Gentiles were coming into the church, but it had to be many weeks, it had to be many days of chaos and pandemonium and, and, and argument and difficulty. And so Peter is trying to discern, well, how do I know what God wants me to do, right? That's, that's the real question here. God, what do you want? What am I supposed to do? And this is the serious work of spiritual discernment. And it starts with prayer. 
And in Peter's case, it starts with probably prolonged periods of, periods of prayer, probably fasting as well. Because he wants to know, what do I do with all these people? And there's no class about this in seminary. Not that Peter went to seminary. I mean, he had the best seminary ever. He hung out with Jesus for three years. But um, there's no one told you what to do. Like, I don't know what to do. This is crazy. It seems impossible. These two warring parties. No, one, no matter what I decide, no one's going to be happy. Or half the people won't be happy. So what do I do? Because half the people are telling Peter, these people are unclean. They're uncircumcised. Our Jewish law forbids hanging out with people like this. There's, we should not allow them in. They're not our kind of people. And then the other group has Peter's ear, and they probably would affirm that we should welcome these people in. So you have this same, this back and forth. Now, I've never been a senior pastor, but I have worked with a lot of them. And one thing I've learned is that senior pastors receive a lot of um, advice, usually unsolicited. Associate pastors do too. Just a little tidbit there. It's sometimes good, sometimes bad, always interesting, always interesting. So I pulled some of my pastor friends, no one who works here, and I asked them, what's some of the craziest stuff you've ever gotten over an email or a conversation, text message? And they anonymously sent back to me some really good stuff. One of them said, a church member said to them, you blink too much when you preach. You're also a very pale person. <laughs> Notice how I didn't blink when I said that? Another person said, I really appreciate the content of your sermons. I just don't like to watch you deliver it. So I like the words from your mouth. I just don't like to look at your face. One person started their email with, I'm not a Christian, but I am a Methodist. <laughs> oh. Oh. Uh, Billy Graham even has a great story about this. He was on an airplane one time, seated next to the then mayor of Charlotte, John Belk, of the Belk department store fame. And uh, they said that on the airplane, there was a very drunk man, very intoxicated, and he was being belligerent, and he was... Uh, being inappropriate with the, the, you know, the, the flight attendants, being loud. And John Belt got his attention and said, excuse me, sir, get it together. Do you know who's sitting here next to me? And the man said, who? Said, it's Billy Graham, the preacher. He said, hey, put her there, pal. Your sermons have really meant a lot to me in my life. <laughs> oh, dear. Peter is essentially the world's first senior pastor, and he is getting it from all sides. Um, I've heard the saying, if you wear the coat, coat of the Confederacy, the pants of the Union, you get shot out of both sides. And Peter's, Peter's getting it right now. And he's probably losing sleep. He's driven to a deep season of prayer and fasting and discernment. Who's in? Who's out? What's sacred? What's profane? What's honoring to God and the law under which we were raised? And so Peter does what you've got to do when you want to discern. You ask God for wisdom. Literally, you ask him repeatedly. James tells us that in the book of James. If any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given you. So Peter resolves himself to not listen to these lobbying voices. And he does the right thing which is he seeks to honor God with this, this, this decision and to ask, God, what do you want? I don't really care what these other people want. I want what you want. That's what matters. Because come what may, I'm going to be accountable to you in my life more than men and women. And that's what Peter does. And he feels the pressure. So much pressure, it drives him to the rooftop to pray. Where in Acts 10 is when he has the vision, and in Acts 11, he just recounts it to everybody else. But he takes it to the rooftop, and he sees this vision of un ceremonially unclean food that, yes, according to the Old Testament law, they were not allowed to eat reptiles and birds of the air and for, you know, with animals with, with hooves that are cloven and all these things. And, and of course, the implication is, is that these Gentiles are clean now because of their faith in Christ. That's the implication. 
So the two points today is, how does God help Peter discern the will of God? Because you can see here that God is helping him. And secondly, what is the will that Peter discerns? So first, Peter has this vision. And you might be thinking, well, that's easy. God gave him a vision. So that doesn't sound like, it's not, it's not a difficult discernment process to deal with. But not so fast. People claim to have visions all the time. But not all of them are legit. So it made me think about a story where I uh, was working at a youth ministry in Charlotte um, at a church called Forest Hill. And uh, I knew I was coming up on a change of my future. I just knew that something was going to be, the fu- I knew I was moving on, but I didn't know where. And so I was praying a lot about that. And looking back, the spirit led this to happen. Where this teenager in the youth group, um, this kid named Rodney, he said, hey, my Christian school is having a revival tonight. I'm like, that sounds cool. I hear a lot, of, a lot of revivals at Christian schools. Do you want to come? And I was like, sure, why not? So I drove down to Fort Mill, South Carolina. I go into the, it's actually the old PTL uh, building where <laughs> Jamie and Tammy Faye had their whole deal. And, um, and I go into this ballroom and there's like all these teenagers with their hands raised and they're shouting and they're worshiping and they're praying. And me being a good Methodist boy, I was like, okay, I'm going to go sit against the wall and put my head down because I didn't know what to do. So I just went and I sat there and I prayed and just kind of took it all in. And of course, a few minutes go by and I knew this was going to happen. People come up and say, can we pray for you? A bunch of young people, younger than me at the time. And I said, sure. And they began to pray over me. And they had these, they quoted scripture, and they also, these guys, I didn't know them from Adam's house cat or whatever that phrase is. I didn't know them at all. And they told me things about what I'd been through that the Spirit spoke through them to affirm me, to encourage me, to help me. It was incredible. It was an incredible experience. The power of God in that moment was amazing. And God used that moment to, to direct me into what was coming up next. And I tell you that story because it was, it was a, it was a spirit led me to that moment and then this word of, of witness or word of affirmation came to affirm what, being there. Does that make sense? This is a spirit and a word coming to affirm me being there. Like, for example, I was attending a meeting recently about the potential future of the United Methodist Church. And I was there and someone in the meeting said, during the opening prayer, when someone said a prayer at the beginning, I, um, someone said they had this picture in their mind Uh, a person I deeply respect, and they uh, saw a mountainside, a dark mountain that seemed impenetrable, and then in the middle of it, there was a sliver of light coming through the center and like a pathway through. And then the person got up in the meeting and shared Isaiah chapter 40, which says, uh, make straight in the, prepare the way of our Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. You see this, and it was an incredible thing because everyone there in the meeting felt like, wow, that's very encouraging to us that we're moving in the right direction. Um, that the Spirit gave this vision, and then this word came along to affirm that vision, like Peter is experiencing here. Because if if you don't have a witness to come along and affirm what the Spirit might be saying, then um, you you really need that witness. Because if we didn't have that word to come along, like Peter has someone come and lay hands on him, Cornelius, uh, Peter might have doubted what he saw, right? Right? He may have written it off. He may have said, oh, I was just hallucinating. I mean, like Satan could come along and say, you didn't see that. That didn't happen. It wasn't real. You were hallucinating. But no, the, the Lord always does this. You see this again and again. People have a vision, and then he sends someone to them to affirm what he just said. It's like that old preaching adage. You tell them what you're going to tell them, and you, you tell them, and then you, you tell them what you told them. <laughs> it's that... God, God knows that left to ourselves, we will doubt what we saw, we will write it off, and we will explain away what we've experienced. So Peter has his vision on the rooftop, and, and the Lord sends Cornelius to him to go, what you saw is real. And now here's the Holy Spirit coming upon all these people to affirm that it's true. The Spirit and the Word working in tandem, affirming one another. Very important. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the former chaplain to the U.S. Senate, said nothing is more dangerous than to put a wedge between the word and the spirit, to emphasize either one at the expense of the other. It is the spirit and the word 
the Spirit upon the Word, and the Spirit in us as we read the Word. David Watson from United Seminary said, All Word and no Spirit we dry up. All Spirit and no Word we blow up. Both Word and Spirit we grow up. The Spirit and the Word always testify to each other, supporting each other. Peter has a vision in the Spirit, and a word of testimony comes along to affirm what he just experienced. So when people say things like, God is doing a new thing, maybe he is, but does it line up with the word? And does the word line up with the spirit? They always testify to each other. So what does Peter discern here? So you see that pattern, how the Lord helps give a spiritual discernment. He gives a vision and then a word or a witness comes along to affirm that. You see it like in 1 Corinthians when Paul teaches about speaking in tongues and all that stuff. And he, he, he says, if no one rises up to translate what the tongues were, then disregard what they, what they said. There has to be a witness to it. Someone has to, someone has to back it up or we can't receive it as the congregation. And it's a similar thing here. And secondly, what, is, what does Peter see here in this will of God for his situation. Well, clearly, it's that uncircumcised Gentiles are considered clean because of their faith in Jesus Christ, that the gospel is for everyone. So whatever your beliefs, I've come to learn this by myself as well, whatever your beliefs, politically or otherwise, we all have the potential to be a Pharisee in our hearts. Right? Right or the left, big time to have this us and them mentality, to judge silently from afar, to feel superior to those people. Attitudes like this have always given birth historically to racism, classism, and false stereotypes. And what happens is, is you drive a wedge between the word and the spirit, and you don't have ears to hear what the spirit is saying when your heart is in that place. You don't. You, you cannot hear God's word, because what's happening is, is that you're elevating your pride over what the word of God says or what the spirit could be saying. And you're not listening. Because the gospel is for all people. That it, being saved by God's grace through faith, it's for all people groups. He saw, Peter saw, that it is not immoral or profane to be a Jew or a non-Jew. Jesus had brown skin. <laughs> he was a Jewish man. He was not a white guy from Europe with blue eyes. Okay, he is a Jewish man with brown or dark hair, okay? Um, God is no respecter of persons in this regard. A- ethnic and racial differences do not matter to God. Heaven is a very, di- is the most diverse place. It is a beautiful tapestry of the creation of God because God only sees the heart. He only sees the unseen. Man looks at the external and we make our decisions, but God doesn't do that. He sees what's what's the unseen, the part of us that makes you, you. So when men and women, when we're standing at the foot of the cross, there are no more racial or ethnic barriers. That's why you could say like there's no more Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. We're all one in Christ Jesus. What makes a person clean in the eyes of God is their trust in Christ. I really believe this. You're gonna be shocked by some of the people you meet in heaven one day. You're gonna be shocked. I think there's gonna be some very... uh, very super religious leaders on this planet. I don't know. (laughs) We'll see. I think it's going to be very upside down than what we expect. The people on this earth that are low, that are unnoticed, will be great. And the people on this earth who are great in the eyes of the world will be low. But we'll still all be one in heaven. Romans 10, 9, maybe one of the most important phrases you can ever read in your life says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved I love that that sentence because it's critically true in what it states but also that there's no qualifiers from Paul when he writes that he doesn't say Jews if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord there's no qualifiers it's just general you if you believe because God's grace is for everyone, that Christianity is not a white man's religion, nor is it a black man's religion. It's for all men and women. And this shows the truth of what Christianity is, is in its impact on the global scale. 
that because the Christianity has touched literally every nation group and people and culture on the face of the earth, we are the biggest and most inclusive movement the earth has ever seen because God is behind it. Now, why? How could it impact the whole world like that? Well, we know this phrase, for God so loved the, to say for God so loved America? No, the world and all that is in it that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him will not die, but have everlasting life. Again, Jesus never gives qualifiers in front of his statements, does he? You and not you. This is for you, but not you. It's for all people. We all have the same needs deep down, Gentile or Jew, to know that you're eternally loved, eternally forgiven, eternally have a place in heaven. And this church and many other churches are going through a time of discernment, as we should. We should. It's always healthy to take stock and to see of where, where we're going and where we need to go and where we shouldn't go. I wish I had answers for that, but I don't. I might have more questions than answers. But you know what? Peter probably had his own opinions too about the matter of Gentiles. But he willingly laid them down to be obedient to what God wanted. Peter could have denied the problem and said, what's the fuss about? He could have stuck his head in the sand and pretended that nothing mattered. He could have said, what's there to discern? But that would be foolish and ignorant and not good leadership. That's not courageous in any way or faithful. But Peter did allow space in his life for the spirit and the word to lead him. And he obeyed. So when the dissenting voices are so loud and they, they, want to, they want to move us, lobby us this way or that, wait. Wait for the spirit. Because when he speaks, you'll know it. And when you want to emotionally prognosticate about what you think should happen, wait, wait for the Spirit and the Word to come along, affirming one another, guiding God's people as they have always done. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you in a time where we are thankful for your presence among us. Thank you that you do give your spirit to lead, to advocate, to guide, to counsel, to give us words when we don't know what to say or to pray or to do. God, in many ways, some of us feel like we're in a wilderness. We don't know what to do or, what to, or where to go. And we pray, Spirit, to give us a vision that you, like you gave Peter. And then give us a word or a word of witness to, to affirm that as you do. Because God, ultimately our desire is to honor you, to be obedient to you above anyone else. And God, I thank you that you, you will honor that desire to be faithful. You desire your people to be faithful. Fill us with holy love from your heart to ours. Give us wisdom from above, our Father. Show us what to do and where to go. Let us listen and be patient. For God, all things will work together for the good of those who love you. We thank you, Lord, that you are on the throne, that you are with us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.